Hello all. It's been a while since I've read anything and uploaded it to my poorly and dearly neglected YouTube channel. But some recent inspiration has um, influenced me to try to return to it. Since, of course, I can't do any poetry readings, which I haven't done that in quite some time, too. Um, which I had a lot of fun doing in the Boston area and in Southern Mass. But here I am. So, I thought I would read a little bit of one of my favorite Zen thinkers, D.T. Suzuki. Zen in Japanese culture. If you want to be a student and learn more about Zen Buddhism, this is a fantastic place to begin some hardcore reading. Alan Watts is a huge devotee of this gentleman. Um, Dr. Suzuki was a national treasure to the Japanese people, culture, civilization, all of it. Um, has written about Zen's impact <clears throat> excuse me, on everything Japanese, from um, Bushido to Haiku, so, and everything in between. So, here's a little bit of the beginning of Zen in Japanese culture. Chapter 1. What is Zen? Before I proceed to write about the influence of Zen on Japanese culture, I must explain what Zen is, for it is possible that my present readers may not know anything about it. As I have already written some books on Zen, however, I will not go into a detailed presentation here. Briefly, Zen is one of the products of the Chinese mind after its contact with Indian thought, which was introduced into China in the first century AD through the medium of Buddhist teachings. There were some aspects of Buddhism in the form in which it came to China that the people of the Middle Kingdom did not quite kindly cherish. For instance, it its advocacy of a homeless life, its transcendentalism or world fleeing and life denying tendency and so on. At the same time, its profound philosophy, its subtle dialectics and penetrating analysis and speculations stirred Chinese thinkers, especially the Taoists or Taoists, if you pronounce it such. Compared with Indians, the Chinese people are not so very philosophically minded. They are rather practical and devoted to worldly affairs. They are attached to the earth. They are not stargazers. While the Chinese mind was profoundly stimulated by the Indian way of thinking, it never lost its touch with the plurality of things. It never neglected the practical side of our daily life. This national or racial psychological idiosyncrasy brought about the transformation of Indian Buddhism into Zen Buddhism. One of the first things Zen accomplished in China as soon as it had gathered its forces and was strong enough to stand by itself was to establish a special form of monasticism quite distinct from the older kind of monkish living. The Zen monastery became a self-governing body while divided into so many departments, each of which had its own office to serve the community. A noteworthy feature of this institution was the principle of complete democracy. While the elders were naturally respected, all members were equally to engage in manual labor, such as gathering fuel, cultivating the land, and picking tea leaves. 
In this, even the master himself joined, and while working with his brotherhood, he guided them to the proper understanding of Zen. This way of living significantly distinguished the Zen monastery from the Sangha Brotherhood, or of the earlier Buddhists of India. The Zen monks were not only democratic, they were willing to employ themselves in all the practical ways of life. They were thus economically minded as well as politically minded. In metaphysics, Zen absorbed much of Taoist teachings, modified by Buddhist speculations. But in its practical conduct of life, it completely ignored both the Taoist transcendentalism and the Indian aloofness from productive life. When a Zen master was asked what his future life would be, he unhesitatingly answered, let me be a donkey or a horse and work for the villagers. Another departure from the older patterns of monkish brotherhood, whether Christian or Buddhist or anything else, was that the Zen monks were not always engaged in offering prayers, practicing penance, or performing other so-called deeds of piety, nor in reading or reciting the economical, uh, canonical books, discussing their contents, or studying them under the master, individually or collectively. What the Zen monks did, besides attending to various practical affairs, both manual and menial, 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 was to listen to the master's occasional sermons, which were short and cryptic, and to ask questions and gather answers. The answers, however, were bizarre and full of incomprehensibles, and they were quite frequently accompanied by direct actions. I will cite one of such examples, perhaps an extreme one, though it did not take place between master and monk, but between monks themselves. It will illustrate the spirit of Zen, which prevailed in its earlier days toward the end of the Tang dynasty. A monk coming out of the monastery that was under the leadership of Rinzai Lin Chi, 867, met a party of three traveling monks belonging to another Buddhist school, and one of the three ventured to question the Zen monk. How deep is the river of Zen? The reference to the river arose from their encounter taking place on a bridge. The Zen monk, fresh from his own interview with Rinzai, was noted for his direct actions, lost no time in replying. Find out for yourself, he said, and offered to throw the questioner from the bridge. But fortunately, his two friends interceded and pleaded for mercy, which saved the situation. Zen is not necessarily against words, but it is well aware of the fact that they are always liable to detach themselves from realities. In turn, into conceptions. And this conceptualization is what Zen is against. The Zen monk just cited may be an extreme. The Zen monk just cited may be an extreme case. But the spirit is there. Zen insists on handling the thing itself and not an empty abstraction. It is for this reason that Zen neglects reading or reciting the sutras or engaging in discourse or abstract subjects. And this is a cause of Zen's appeal to men of action in the broadest sense of the term. Through their practical mindedness, the Chinese people, and also to a certain extent, the Japanese, have taken greatly to Zen. Arigatou gozaimasu.